Now we move to, to talks uh, from the perspective of digital infrastructure. And um, I would like to welcome on stage Jauco Noordzij. Uh, he is head of the product development uh, department of digital infrastructure. Um, he uh, joined the Huygens Institute in 2015 as an architect and a lead engineer for the Timbuktu team. Um, and he will talk about finding the right gear. Jauco, please welcome him. you um, yeah finding the right gear really means me talking a lot about um, sustainable infrastructure software development problems and, and and the challenges we face the programmatic abstractions that we're going to do so I can understand if that's not really the most exciting talk of your day today um, and to be honest ha, um, I'm also a bit hesitant to giving this talk, because I'm going to be talking about a lot of abstract uh, uh, things. I can't even frame them right. Um, these abstract things aren't even the things that I've been doing. I like talking about what I've been doing. I don't really like to talk about what I'm going to do next year. So it's kind of a visionary thing. Um, and I'm not allowed to get too technical, so I'm not allowed to use technical words. So really, it's, it's, I'm not in my comfort zone right now. <coughs> I do agree that someone should be up here and talk about my department, because we're easy to, uh, to mis misjudge, mischaracterize. We're, we're quite a unique department in the field, right? We're not scholars. We're not quite scientific programmers, almost, but not quite. But there's a difference. And to explain that difference, I think it's a good idea to just go over the, the scholarly process, right? Not just the humanities process or the scientific process, just the, the scholarly process in a whole that you all are doing. Usually, you start with some data. Might be old data, might be new data, whatever. You then study the data. You can do this using, you know, close reading, or using, I hate the clicker right now, distant reading, right? But over time, you get a, a feel, a mental model of the data. When you get the mental model, at some point, you will start to curate the data, right? Improve it. You're using tools to, cura to, to go through the data, so you also improve the tools. Then, after a while, well, really, there's two different approaches here. Most of you will wait until they get some insight, some brilliant idea, <laughs> then write a whole bunch of papers. And, uh, well, that's their thing. Uh, the other ones of you, you just publish the data as it is, right? The, the, the curated, improved data, that's a product as a whole. Regardless of your concrete approach, this is what happens. Right? I I'm sure everyone here is familiar with that process. Well, for the past few years, I've been observing this, and a few, a few things sprung to my attention. You improve the data, and then there's a lot to do about uh, logging, keeping track of who improved what, how, why, with what tools, right? The provenance of the data. That's a, well, let's call it a thing in here. Um, you improve the tools, and uh, to be sure, you like improving the tools while you're working on it. You might not like it if someone else starts using the tool after you've improved it, right? Because they, they ask all these kind of annoying questions, like, how do I use this version of the tool? Or, where are the files? This is, not, this is a comic, but it's not a joke. <laughs> I, I, I've been in meetings where it was like, and where are the files? And people get, went like, uh. If you publish your software or your data set as a new product, you have the annoying problem that most of the costs of a software product are incurred after it's released. Right? So that's the, the, the eternal drag on you from that moment on. So, three issues and a new department with a plan. <laughs> I'm, I promise to be not too technical. So, um, <laughs> uh, 
I tried to model software, and I modeled it like this. <laughs> now, I just heard that black boxes are not allowed in the humanities. <laughs> and really, it's not just that they're not allowed. Software is never a black box, right? To, to someone who understands the software, it's always filled with, with specific parts, right? That's how a programmer sees it. He doesn't see the whole box, he sees the parts. And maybe you have a different software tool, and to the programmer, it's just the same parts, different configuration. Right? To us, it's not that different. Maybe we edit the thing. I get really annoyed by the clicker. Um, so, the problem here is not that it is, this is a correct representation of how it is, it's that it's almost correct and it's wrong. So, the products that you use are composed of of tools that we write, right? But the product that you use isn't the sum of the parts. That, that's the whole problem. And as an example, you can have this perfectly functioning deadbolt attached to a perfectly functioning sliding door, <laughs> missing the mark completely, right? Now, in software development, if I can pull on the metaphor a bit, um, what happens is that we have this normal door that we then turn into a sliding door, and suddenly the whole security system is broken. Right? That's what happens for us. So what we should do is we should make sure that when we work on these uh, combined systems, that they're explicit to us, that we can track them, that we can follow them, that they're assignable to a person. So without telling you how, this is one thing that we do. To build software out of reusable components, and then be able to assign people to the structure as a whole. Now, once you've done that trick, a second trick becomes apparent. Because some of these components are more alike than others, right? So, the reddish ones and the bluish ones. If you then say, that's a, a different product, but it's a product in its own, right? There's the product for text analysis things and the product for, for geo analysis things. And your, your research project might use some text analysis and some geo analysis. But the, the text analysis thing product as a whole is maybe easier to communicate about and easier to see a roadmap for. So what we're doing is we're going to put scholars in charge of these areas, these, these broader uh, products, and to allow them to uh, define how these areas are going to evolve. Um, and that's really one of our biggest tricks. Took a lot of effort to, to get it through the, the, the organization, but A, we can evolve products outside of a research project. B, it's under the, the auspices of a scholar. That took some work. And with those two, we fix almost all your problems, well, half. Um, basically, the maintenance, that's our main problem, so we fix that mostly. And uh, the documentation, a bit. And really, to fix the other of your problems, the provenance and the maintenance of the, the tool improvements that you did yourself, um, you need to change a bit. And in order to change, it's often good to add a little bit of friction to your process, right? So you can save money easily by stacking coins on the table, there's no problem there. But you may find it easier to save money by putting it, in a it into a piggy bank. This doesn't limit your options, you're still able to, to get at the money, but, but it helps. And to us then, it's important to make sure that this is a little bit of friction and we don't get into a full computer says no situation, right? Because that's really, traditionally, that's our kind of department strategy. Like the, the IT guys uh, are gardening your problems for you, right? So that's not how we're going to work. We've had quite a bit of success by allowing everything into our systems and then just noting some qualities about it. Half of the data is missing. No judgment, but half of it is missing, right? It might be the half that you don't need. That's up to you. So 
by us keeping track of a lot of the provenance for you, we can allow normal scholarly criticism and peer review to function. So that's our third main trick. Okay, so one to go. Well, we have this, these non-black boxes, right? Why should we only allow you to work with the outer shell? Why don't we give you access to everything in it? Why should there be developers on the one hand and, and scholars on the other hand? Maybe we should give everyone access to all the tools. This requires some engineering and some ma mainly some uh, organizational changes. Um, but once we do that, a thing becomes clear, which is that a lot of the, the, um, the gatekeeping uh, style of work that the program does isn't done by the programmer, but by the, sorry, by the tool, but by the programmer. So really, we should embed that gatekeeping into our tools. And we're not getting into the computer says no situation, so we're putting them on an axis, and we're saying there's software that should be really stable, really focused, really, really not easy to change, but very solid. And then there's the software that you can easily change, right? Say you have a script on your laptop. Ha. You have a script on your laptop, and um, you want to run it on some data. Then the full database, of course, we use a, a database system that doesn't change too often, but the script is some Python script on your laptop. Then if you want to publish the results and you want an easily referenceable uh, version, you should put your script into some source control system uh, so that we can generate a reference with, uh, uh, with the version of the tool you use to generate the data. So that's really the fourth trick. Um, to make sure that, that we uh, balance the amount of friction to get better results. Now, <laughs> I put this next one in before them, but I'm really happy I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, Jauko, for this very entertaining talk.